Hello, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. It is I, Emily Sophia, aka M. Mighty Sophia, here to break down for you guys the latest episode of Better Call Saul. Better late than never. We are on season three, episode three, Sunk Costs. So, spoiler alert before I dive into the mad thick of things, as I shall be endeavoring to bear all in this review. I apologize for the tardiness of this review. I was giving myself some space to process the Bates Motel series finale last night. So I appreciate your patience and I hope I didn't lose too much of my weekly audience, but here we go. So this was, of course, yet another brilliant episode in what has been a nothing but brilliant series. And something that I love about Better Call Saul is the fact that the transitional episodes, as they are lovingly called, they're never wasted space in this show. There is always something fascinating at play. There are always so many nuances um, to, to relish and to analyze. And so I'm going to do my best to recap all the events of the night and intersperse my thoughts and reactions and analyses throughout. So we begin with the opening shot of these battered looking tennis shoes hanging from a telephone wire against a golden sky. Yet another striking scene that is, uh, and, and this episode is bookended by this really visually striking stuff. Um, what with this shot, and then we also get the closing shot of the darkened, shadowy silhouettes of Kim and, uh, and Jimmy as they are deciding that, yes, in fact, they are going to fight back. And it's just such gorgeous freaking stuff. But anyway, so we are back in the desolate wilderness, not far from the border. And we see this uh, Los Poyos Hermanos mobile making its raucous way through the desert and it stops right beneath this wire for a moment next to some bullet hole riddled alto sign. And the shoes drop not long after it drives away. And it's the very same pair, of course, as we come to find out that Mike hung up some indeterminate amount of time ago. Could be months, could be a year, years, whatever. Um, but uh, this this shows us basically uh, in conjunction with the passing Los Poyos Hermanos truck that Mike has had a hand or I guess a foot of sorts. We're talking about the shoes in expanding Gus's drug empire at the expense of his rival, of course. And this is not just an atmospheric opener, but a glimpse of things to come or things that have already come if you're a partaker in the Breaking Bad lore. So we are back with Mike on that lonely desert road where he first finds the gas cap and the cell phone. And surely enough, Gus is the guy on the other end of the line and uh, makes himself known and expresses a disinterest in a violent confrontation. So he's in one of two vehicles that pull up on either side of Mike. And at last, the two legends meet. The former brandishes the don't note, and the latter responds, it is not in my interest for Hector Salamanca to die at this time. A little addendum there. He's an associate of an associate, you see. Mike doesn't exactly find that all that compelling. Hector Salamanca, of course, threatened his family, and Mike does not take that kind of offense lightly, nor should he. So Gus presses further, clearly trying to gauge whether Mike may prove an ally to him as he tries to weaken, but not quite extinguish his competitor. Now, Mike took his family out of danger and accepted Hector's money, and Gus reminds him of that. But then he turns around and robs the bastard, you know, not to mention there was the, the calculated, if not rash, act uh, which cost civilian lives. And Gus says most men would have walked away, but instead you made an attempt on his life. And he tests the waters a little bit longer and then finally shows his hand. He wouldn't stop Mike if, say, he were to strike a second time, you know what I'm saying? Vengeance so sweet, you can't settle for just one measly taste. And that fits the description of something that would be in Gus's best interest. Mike claims that he's done at first, and Gus civilly consents, and, you know, he accedes and is ready to back away, but uh, Mike pipes up, 
He is not done by any stretch of the imagination, and he can see that Gus is looking to disrupt Hector's supply chain, at least. Rattle the chain, if you will. Cripple the competition a bit. Maybe their agendas have a little bit more of an overlap than they initially thought. So, the illicit partnership begins there, and it's all very exciting stuff. So, we see Jimmy calls Francesca and asks her to move his appointments around. He's still at Chuck's and um, pops a squad on the curb and lights a cigarette as he awaits Chuck's roundabout retribution by way of police intervention. Chuck, at this point, informs him of his plan to help Jimmy by pressing charges and going the full nine yards. And uh, once Jimmy faces the music, he'll come out a better man or so, Chuck thinks. He, he thinks that he's finally showing him how to make a change before it's too late or he destroys himself or someone else. Almost valid, but not quite. There is way too much douchebaggery afoot here. I mean, man, he's just such an inspirational speaker, isn't he? Guy could preach to the masses if only he had a candlelit stadium, you know? So Jimmy's ride shows up after he promises Chuck in a moment that I loved that he will die alone hooked up to the machines that will torture him until he keels over. Prophetic much? <laughs> so as Jimmy gets impounded, a familiar face from his public defender days comes sniffing around to see what the cat dragged in. It's just a familial squabble, as Jimmy says. He intends to tackle his own defense as well in one of many ill-advised choices that he will make in the days to come. He'll be the devil and the angel on his own shoulders. Thank you very much. So the two wheelers and dealers of days gone by engage in a little bit of tongue-in-cheek banter before um, Jimmy's old computer. Uh, I think his name is Oakley. Pretty sure he's the deputy district attorney. That's his role. Um, but anyway, so he offers to move up his hearing and gives some advice about showing dominance in his new digs in prison. <laughs> So we get to see a splashy training montage-esque array of scenes from a morning in the life of Kim Wexler, office sleeper and gym shower extraordinaire. <laughs> and then uh, Ernie shows up to tell Kim that he got terminated and Jimmy got penned. All shall keel before Chuck and his Old Testament wrath. So Jimmy, for one, is now uh, Jimmy. <laughs> I just combined their names. It's like a ship name. Oh my god, that's terrible. Jimmy is rocking the orange jumpsuit. His hearing gets started and he's facing fourth degree felony, petty misdemeanor assault, criminal damage to property, another little dis disdemeanor. <laughs> what is happening to my words? But anyway, the, the judge is all too familiar with the Miguel brothers, it's very clear, and Kim arrives just in time to represent her wayfaring client, but Jimmy insists that he go it alone. He's none too happy about it, but this is his responsibility, between him and his blood. So once Jimmy makes it back to the office, he, you know, he reveals how furious he is at the whole debacle, but he's gotta shoulder this burden solo. Kim doesn't deserve to take the hit. She's finally on the Mesa Verde case, and her, her involvement in their mushrooming familial fallout would only jeopardize their business, business, <laughs> business, and inflict further harm on Kim in the process. His motives seem pretty honorable, you know? Selfless and selfish all rolled into one. And Kim hears Jimmy out, you know, it's it's not like he gives her any room to convince him that maybe he shouldn't go stag against an adversary as conniving and Mach Machiavellian as his brother. So she offers a straight okay once he reaches the end of his impassioned address. And Francesca, as it turns out, took it upon herself to touch up Jimmy's mural. It's a sweet gesture, but it ain't enough to save Jimmy from the hell to come. <laughs> And he says, oh, this is not a normal week at the firm, but honestly, I think that this is just about as normal as things are going to get for a long time, if, <laughs> if they're ever going to pull up again, honestly. So we get to see Mike pay the doctor a visit on Gus's behalf. He picks up a nebulous package of nondescript drugs, and we get the privilege of seeing what he does with them later on, of course. 
And then we get another little taste of nostalgia at the Courthouse's Instant Coffee Maker, which Jimmy frequented many a time, I will recall, in, in seasons past. And Jimmy meets up with Oakley again, who goes from freaking double fisting two different bags of chips to mooching off of Jimmy's fries. I swear, me and that guy, we, <laughs> we are soulmates. <laughs> I'm a bit of a sodium fiend myself sometimes, but this guy <laughs> takes it to a whole nother level. So head held as high as possible. Jimmy's confident that this quote-unquote misunderstanding will, in fact, blow over. It's all going to be good. <laughs> no way it's going to go to trial. And he might be able to plea out of this, but... Sadly, his buddy Oakley is not going to be the one prosecuting. In fact, nobody in Albuquerque can take the case. Everybody knows him. <laughs> that much is apparent. So somebody from outside Jimmy's cozy little circle will take charge. So Jimmy's breezy disposition immediately sours upon receiving this news, which makes sense. He loses control once again and similarly loses interest in the trans fats of his burger, in which his old colleague is all too eager to partake. Because as we all know, trans fats are the best fats. <laughs> Ching. <laughs> um, this, this guy can't help but pry too um, into uh, what happened when Jimmy left Davis in Maine. He is all about getting the nitty gritty details there, but he wasn't able to make off with much sadly as we know. There is nary a sleek German car to be found. Sadly. <laughs> and that is the least of Jimmy's problems at this point, of course. But we return to Mike, who is desert bound once again. We see him lace up some red sneakers and stuff them with an illicit substance, giving us more context for the opening scene, of course. This moment is, in fact, um, the precursor to that. Um, takes him a few attempts to toss those high tops where he wants to get them, but he does hit his mark after a few tries. But it only took Walter White one shot with the iconic rooftop pizza toss. I'm just saying, you gotta step up your game if you want to be the first try guy, Mike. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you have been bested, at least in the future. So, Miss Hay, Jimmy's prosecutor, visits Chuck to try and get her story straight, and we can see the missing drawer on Chuck's desk when the two of them meet together in his home. He's concerned, of course, that Chuck won't uh, cooperate with her office, being family and all, but <laughs> that will not be a problem whatsoever. So, the two discuss her courtroom strategy, and she informs Chuck that... Chuck... She informs Chuck. Oh my god, this is... I am hitting a record for screw-ups in a single review. I love this accidental wordplay. I hope that somebody in the comments is keeping track of this madness. But anyways, yes, this whole thing could go to trial. And Chuck then promises that he'll be able to appear in court as a witness, providing that a few minor arrangements are made as he braves the world's hostile electromagnetic forces. But before Miss Hay can excuse herself and get to work, Chuck slips into this fabricated state of remorse. Admittedly, I thought it was genuine at first until the final scene of the episode where, of course, the other shoe drops, just as the shoes dropped at the beginning of the episode. There's a lot of really cool narrative and visual parallels that we get here, which is just another aspect of what makes this, again, quote-unquote, transitional episode all the more substantial, you know? Um, but anyways, so... <laughs> I was just thinking to myself, when am I going to learn, much less Jimmy? Because every time this guy shows his human side, I want to buy it. I really, really do. But yeah, he suddenly starts gushing about Jimmy's good heart. And oh, he just gets emotional and flies off the handle, you know? So he seems to be backpedaling at this point, which makes no freaking sense whatsoever, knowing how calculated of a person Chuck is. But then he says, you know, he's just hoping for a solution for everyone, which means what? 
Miss Hay is understandably perplexed by this. But he's just getting started, let me tell y'all. This is all about teaching Jimmy the lesson he wants to drive home. It begins with knocking Jimmy down every rung he's climbed to get to where he is today in the legal and professional world. Those adoring elders be damned, Jimmy is a blight on the law and an affront to principled do-gooders everywhere. Or so Chuck would have the world believe. And maybe, just maybe, he will get his way. If all of this, uh, you know, we, we don't know what role exactly this is going to play in Jimmy's downfall. Other than that, yes, it's gonna play a role in it. So we return to Mike again. He is in sniper mode following a couple of Hector's boys with his binoculars. And the colorful Regalo Halado truck pulls off not far from the hanging shoes. And Mike starts firing his gun repeatedly and methodically and the, the two goons are so thrown off that they figure it must be a hunter, which I'm not exactly sure what you would be hunting for and where in that area. I am a complete and utter stranger to the uh, locale of New Mexico and, you know, southern border whatnot. Um, but anyways, this is exactly what Mike wanted, of course. Um, gives him the cover under which to spring his trap and uh, pour a little sugar, if you will. So the crooks deposit their weaponry and whatever else underneath a tire and go about their business. Mike keeps firing away and his trigger-happy antics have the desired effect because they are no longer considered a disturbance to the pair. But that's when he shoots a hole in the telltale shoe at the perfect moment, makes it rain on the drug runners, and he, oh gosh, Mike executes the entire scheme so flawlessly. Precision is, is ever on his side. I, I gotta say, when it comes to our favorite fixer of few words, Mr. Mike Ehrmantraut, Patience is both a virtue and a vice. <laughs> so sadly for our unsuspecting smugglers, the ice cream jig is up. And Hector is about to feel the hurt, that is for sure. So, Jimmy is smoking again as uh, Kim burns the midnight oil over Mesa Verde, or perhaps she's already preemptively working on Jimmy's case even though he has told her not to. Um, and there's this cool moment where she can just glimpse the flicker of his silhouette on the other side of the glazed glass and she goes outside to join him. So the two of them puff on a shared nicotine stick, a very old and gross one as it turns out. And Jimmy tells Kim about the deal offer and it's, well, it's not what he thought. And Kim's like, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Why, why are you being so circumspect about this? Um, and it turns, turns out that he's being offered a pre-prosecution diversion, a PPD, if you will. <laughs> um, and this comes across as great news on the surface. Uh, I mean, he'll have to confess to everything, even the assault and all of that good jazz. But here's, here's the catch. The PPD was Chuck's brainchild. And it requires that Jimmy send his written confession, his felonious acts in writing, to the New Mexico Bar Association. Of course. Guilty to felony, disbarment, boom. Hook, line, and sinker. Chuck doesn't want jail time for slipping Jimmy. Mm -mm, that's not how he sees this going down. He wants him out of the law, period, as penitence for his ill-gotten success. Above all else, he wants him disbarred at day's end. So Chuck would seem to have Jimmy right where he wants him. But at this juncture, Kim digs her heels in and she refuses to let Jimmy go it alone against Chuck and his legion, you know. Jimmy doesn't want to drag Kim down with him, but they've weathered worse, right? <laughs> There's a lot that the two of them have endured, um, but it's it's the fallacy of sunk costs, as uh, as Kim tells him, and that's actually a callback to uh, to a quote from the first episode of the second season. Um, and now, as a reminder, the sunk cost fallacy is when quote your decisions are tainted by the emotional investments you accumulate. 
And the more you invest in something, the harder it becomes to abandon it. <laughs> so bear that in mind, folks, bear that in mind. But it is time now, according to Jimmy and Kimmy, to take that PPD and uh, put it up Chuck's poop shoot. <laughs> Together they fight, risking disbarment and jail time if they lose in court. Man, I'm actually amazed that I didn't mess up the stupid poop shoot joke of all the freaking spoonerisms I pulled in this review. <laughs> but anyways, that's just about everything that happens in the episode. There's there's a lot more ground I could cover. Of course, you can go deep and wide in this show as far as you want. Um, but yeah, so we are definitely setting ourselves up for an exciting courtroom dance. Little showdown between the McGill bros. And uh, yeah, we are definitely headed in a very scary direction. I continue to be so compelled by the depths of Chuck's depravity. <laughs> it's, it's just stunning to me because he continues to fool me. He continues to get under my skin and have these moments of, of vulnerability. And I would attribute so much of that not only to the writing, but to, uh, to the performance of, of Michael McKean. Um, and just the the, um, is it pathos or ethos that he brings to the performance? I, I'm constantly getting those two confused, but there, there are these moments where this genuine flawed person seems to surface, but now it seems like everything that Chuck is doing is geared towards facilitating his brother's demise, and he doesn't even see it that way. You know, he is so delusional. In, in just the most mind-blowing ways that he thinks he is doing a good thing. He is, is, is doing the hard things that you have to do as family when you see your, your brother, your sister, your, your cousin, your whoever floundering in their bad choices. And he thinks that, that by exacting this punishment, he's going to get the desired outcome of being the one right, Jimmy being the one wrong, and 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 that's the only dynamic that that he wants. He doesn't want to lift up his brother as he thinks he does. He wants to push him down. But I'm I'm recalling um, a quote in a previous season where Jimmy tells Chuck to roll around in the dirt with him to, to finally get into this mess. And I think, I think that, that Chuck is going to be affected by the collateral damage of the situation in ways that he doesn't expect. I think that Jimmy's prediction of how Chuck is going to die, I think that that rings even truer than he realizes um, in his state of disbelief and anger. I'm very excited to see the initiation of the partnership between Mike and Gus, who are so equally matched <laughs> in, in the most unexpected ways. And, and we see how their, their sensibilities are already coinciding and they are going to make for very intriguing uh, associates in the days to come. So that's about everything from me. Thank you so much for tuning in for this review, late as it is. Whatever else you guys want to talk about in the comments below, please, please bring it up. If you happen to have been watching Bates Motel as well and you missed my finale review, it's up on my channel too. So American Gods is coming around the corner. That's going to be the next new show that I bring into the fold. So be expecting reviews of that. I believe it's an eight episode first season and I am going to do my best to do weekly episode by episode reviews of that. So stay tuned. All right. Now you guys take care of yourselves, please. And as always, I will be back before you know it.